This satellite could be your next ISP. Ask yourself if your internet is fast or slow, like an old pickup truck. The internet is not a big truck, it's a series of tubes. Well, we came to meet the folks who are taking the internet out of the tubes and putting it into space. There are three to four billion people in the world that do not have reliable access to broadband internet. They have smartphones, just like we do, but those smartphones are still stuck on a 2G internet connection, you know, the equivalent of dial-up, and that's what we've got to fix. Why do this? Well, ever since the internet broke into the mainstream, it's become more and more essential to our daily lives. Now, if you don't have reliable internet access, you're essentially cut off from modern society. The traditional ways of connecting people to the internet just don't work for the next four billion people. You would never think that the only way to connect somebody is by strapping something to a rocket, having it blast into orbit and like be bathed in radiation for 10 years. Like, how is that the cheapest and most effective way? But, but it is. But this is about more than just satellites. It's about a whole new approach to building infrastructure. Something that's extra important when things go wrong. Stick around to see why. This is Hard Reset, a series about rebuilding our world from scratch. This is my old office building. That's correct. I used to work in this not impressive looking building. And while I worked here, even though this is San Francisco, supposedly one of the most connected cities in the world, we couldn't even get DSL. The only way to get broadband access was to install either a microwave receiver that talked to an antenna on Mount Diablo, about 40 miles away, or a dish that could talk to a satellite in orbit. At the time, satellite internet access was extremely expensive and extremely slow. And that apparently left these companies with very small budgets for their commercials. Directway is the high-speed internet that works anywhere in the continental U.S. You can see what I mean. Interested? Thought so. There are four billion people around the world that are not connected to the internet. These aren't people that are, you know, all in far-flung places around the world. Some of these people are in the United States. If a hospital in Alaska wanted to have, like, a gigabit line, which in San Francisco is, like, what, 80, 100 bucks per month, it might literally cost them $20,000 a month. That's Christian. He is the chief of staff for a new startup right next to my old office that's aiming to change all of that. We came to Astronus to see how they're connecting millions, maybe billions of people to the internet with satellites in space. This is what a fancy satellite factory looks like. It's very clean, but let me just say it turns out there's a lot of different ways to die in here. Anyway. You've probably heard of satellite internet companies like Starlink before, but this is very different. Starlink satellites are in LEO, which stands for Low Earth Orbit. That means they have to orbit the Earth very quickly to avoid falling back down into the gravity well. It also means that any dish down here on Earth has to track those satellites as they move across the sky. And any time that dish needs to jump to tracking the next satellite, it'll lose connection with the internet. The challenge with low Earth orbit is you have to launch thousands of satellites in order to provide a sort of a usable service because each satellite is really only overhead for five or six minutes at a time. This is John. He's the co-founder of Astronus, and he took an idea from one of our favorite sci-fi writers and turned it into a business. Arthur C. Clarke actually invented geostationary orbit. He came up with this idea that if you can put a satellite out at just the right distance from Earth, its orbit will match the rotation of the Earth's surface, and you could bounce signals off of it. Astronus is putting small satellites at GEO, or geostationary equatorial orbit, which is about 20 times further away. Oh, no, it's, uh, no, it's like 100 times. <laughs> no, well, that is very far. Yeah, it's about a tenth of the way to the moon. Anyway, because these satellites orbit at the same speed as the rotation of the Earth, from our perspective, they stay in one place in the sky. Every geostationary orbital slot is exactly 35,786 kilometers away from Earth and is exactly at the equator. We actually call it the most valuable real estate in the solar system because each spot that a satellite, or in our case, a cluster of satellites could take up, there's only so many of those to go around. So we really have to make sure we're making maximum use of those. That means you don't need a fancy dish that can track LEO satellites back and forth across the sky. And it means a single satellite can cover a much larger area. All this is possible because it's gotten far more affordable to launch things into space, thanks to companies like SpaceX. Astronus started with a 3U CubeSat, roughly the size of a loaf of bread. 
But now they're launching a larger model, more like the size of a small refrigerator. We have satellites up today that move data around in this way, but they are huge Goliath satellites that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and often take years, if not a decade, to build and launch. They were able to do all of this by completely throwing away the assumptions about how to build hardware for high orbits and start from first principles. But space is hard between the flight computer, all the software running on it, all the suite of sensors, and then all of the cutting edge radio technology that has to be packed in. Getting all of that to work along with all the ground systems, all the networking systems, it really all has to line up for something like this to work, especially on the very first try. Well, let's just call that statement foreshadowing. Getting all these different parts to work together requires a lot of testing, which all starts with these smocks. Let's see if anyone here works here named Nick. B-Money. That's pretty good. All right. I'm just jealous. I don't have a personalized one, but that's fine. So we refer to this area as panel integration land. Basically, the satellite's composed of six panels. Is that big reflective sphere in the middle of those the fuel tanks? Yeah, it's one of our tanks and it's wrapped in MLI. So we call that stage of integration TIE Fighter, resembled a TIE Fighter and kind of rolled with it. Company of engineers, so we like Star Wars jokes. Yeah, it's not unusual. <laughs> this is Effie. She is the mechanical integration lead and a googly eye specialist. More on that later. This is basically what a fully assembled vehicle would look like. It's on our breakover fixture. So the purpose of this is to Take all the panels you've built over here, put them on this, shake the heck out of them to make sure they don't break, I'm yep. guessing, and do all the sort of like testing on this sort of fake version of the final satellite. Yep. Do you guys just have like a giant paint shaker from... Uh... Yeah, I mean, so this is our spacecraft level vibe table right here. Oh, this is the shaker? Yep. Um, so right now it's set up to do X, Y, um, and then the okay. shaker head will rotate up and that's how it does the Z axis. Wow, okay. But yeah, this is our shaker table for a few low-level runs. We put some googly eyes on it. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was just like, it's actually just like really adorable seeing the eyes like roll around. Um, so we always joke that we qualled those eyes for space. But passing the literal vibe check isn't the only thing that's done here. There are tests done in thermal vacuum chambers where the satellite experiences wild temperature fluctuations, just like in space. A propulsion test chamber inspects propulsion systems behind this uh, ominous structure with a bulletproof curtain. And there's also an RF dead zone so they can test the electronics to ensure they don't interfere with each other. Basically, they test for everything, because once you send it up to space, there's no sending a repairman after it. A fact that will become important later in this story. Anyway. Things are gonna get hot, things are gonna get cold, things are gonna shake up and down, left and right on that rocket going up. You're gonna have stars exploding all around you, sending a bunch of ionized radiation out to you. Can your hardware handle it? Or will it literally blow up? In our case, not the latter. That's Brady Souls. <laughs> he's the electrical integration lead and he's got the coolest smock in the whole factory. I have to ask, this is B-Money is the name? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, so my dad, his name is Rich Souls. And when back when they were like inventing email, he invented our dollar sign way before anyone else did it. Oh, so what? it's, you know, passed on down. I've stolen it. Oh, very and if any of my brothers ask, I did first. Brady's brothers have brothers? not asked. All right. Anyway, B Money is making sure that all this expensive hardware they shoot up into space is powered and returns the highest quality data back. How do you make sure that that thing is going to go work in space? If you have a lot of high power things or high frequency things, Spoiler alert, circuits are like people. They want to talk to each other. They're all going to be bouncing around, introducing noise to each other, going up, down, left, right, figuring this out. And proving that's not going to be an issue and really getting that right is really difficult in simulation and it's even harder in real life. Right. So you spend a lot more time on the R&D cycle getting it just right. All this R&D, production, testing, and assembly happens right here on site so that all the teams can coordinate much more quickly before getting ready for launch. Oh, Effie. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's the, that's the box that we use to transport Arcturus down to Cape Canaveral. That's where Astronauts sent their first geosatellite, Arcturus, into space. Can satellites finish the job that Al Gore started? I took the initiative in creating the internet. Let's find out. This is our San Francisco Mission Operations Center. We actually have a backup 
in Utah, Eagle Mountain, Utah, in case the big earthquake hits in San Francisco, something happens, we can quickly shift our operations over to there. Wow. You couldn't get Houston? Because I hear that's a great spot for Everyone mission. wanted to go there, but all the, yeah, it was all taken. <laughs> this is mission control for the Astronis satellites. Right now, they're just watching Arcturus, the one with its antennas pointed towards Alaska. A lot of time we're monitoring, but things do happen on the spacecraft. But everything is deployed now and it's chilling? Yeah. I wouldn't want this to be an exciting job for you. Yes. <laughs> Very much so, yes. But soon, they're hoping to have as many as 24 satellites built and launched every year to cover other places where people need access to information but can't get Comcast to return their phone calls. Right now, you're probably watching this video online, connected to the internet. Pause and think for a moment about how that's even possible. Think about the vast web of computers, cables, and other means of transmission that bring millions of bits of information to you every second. Now remember that the Earth is immense, and connecting humans with this kind of fidelity and consistency across vast distances is far from easy. But with technology like Astronus' satellites, you could be a thousand miles away from the nearest person or the nearest telephone line and still be able to stream friends in 4K. Or this show. Either one is fine. The experience is going to be very similar to what people are used to for like satellite TV. And this isn't very expensive or very complicated equipment. It's like a piece of stamped aluminum. A single satellite can provide broadband to a huge area. And that means one tiny dot up in space will replace the need to string thousands and thousands of miles of fiber optic cables to all those remote locations. Satellite connections aren't great for everything. They are terrible for low latency applications like gaming. I would not advise that you game on a geo connection. <laughs> uh, you will not do very well. Uh, uh, you will be last place or something. But it's limited by the laws of physics. It's just how fast can the speed of light go. Uh, if you can figure out a way to speed up the, the speed of light, let me know and then we'll, we'll, we'll implement it immediately. <laughs> we are building four more satellites that will be launching on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket later this year. And they'll be going up and delivering this service to countries all over the world. And then we are gonna be adding satellites over time as we see that increased demand to add capacity to those countries. But it's important to remember that this is a new venture, that Arcturus is their first geosynchronous satellite. So it's not shocking to learn that not everything went perfectly to plan. A month after filming, we learned that one of the solar panel drive assemblies supplied by a third-party vendor experienced an anomaly, which is space talk for it's not working right. That means Arcturus won't be able to provide internet service to Alaska. Also, me playing around with the power cable outside had nothing to do with this. Sorry, Alaska. We are pretty sure. But this anomaly, despite being a big, expensive snafu, sort of proves the whole point of Astronus. If this had happened to a satellite that cost hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, it would have been a staggering blow. But Astronus is banking on smaller infrastructure projects and more flexible hardware, so they're already planning to launch a new satellite, UtilitySat, which definitely does not sound as cool as Arcturus. But they can afford to do this because the satellites are so much less expensive and because they're so much more adaptable. In the old days, each satellite was custom bespoke built for the part of the world that it was gonna be serving because every part of the world has actually slightly different frequencies they're allowed to operate on. There was no digital signal processing happening on board the satellites of any kind. And many of the satellites that they're still launching today are purely analog satellites. It'd be like getting a radio where you can't change the channel after you get it from the hardware store. So it is only in the last few years that we've had the processing power, the silicon, in order to do the kind of digital processing that we want to do. The idea behind all this is more than just satellites and internet connection. It's about how we build the systems that make our world function. This is a hard reset for the type of internet infrastructure that you build. We want to have micro projects that we are deploying exactly when they're needed, exactly where they're needed, anywhere in the world. So picture a scenario where the grid doesn't grow out from the center, but from everywhere at once. Imagine you didn't need to wait for some giant utility company or government to invest billions of dollars to run fiber to your small town or state or country. And because those investments are smaller, 
it's easier to recover from setbacks and makes the whole thing more resilient. So instead of investing a billion dollars over 20 years to provide, you know, a whole continent connectivity, we want to invest, you know, tens of millions of dollars over 18 months to provide connectivity exactly where it's needed to one state. Astronus and other companies like Ukama, which makes hardware for DIY cell phone networks, represent a new bottom-up approach to building infrastructure. It's an approach that can reach people in places that are mostly overlooked. If you have the next 4 billion people all connected to the internet, all of a sudden they're part of that global conversation, right? Like they're contributing their own YouTube videos and they're contributing their own Reddit posts and they're, they're teaching the rest of the world things that the rest of the world just doesn't have access to now. There's a two-way street to the internet, right? It's a thing that we're all creating together. So how many more amazing people will join in to the world we take for granted when the internet is something as universal as the stars in the sky? Well, we'll find out soon.